there's very few places, you know, in the country that you can see the sky like you do in Montana. There's just things that you cannot find, no matter where you go, that are always going to be at home. You, know, you look at a map of reservations, they're so desolate and isolated. One of the things that I've seen you now with youth, I'm gonna do something great with my life so I can leave the reservation, you know, so I can get off the reservation. It's hard living here. And when you're a kid, you don't understand that living here is different from living somewhere else. When I was growing up, my grandmother, she always used to do this thing, don't cry, my girl, don't cry. Back when I was 15, 14, it was easier just to pretend. I'm just gonna pretend that it didn't happen. It's not easy facing the person that sexually assaulted you. You gotta stand up and find that courage to look your aggressor in the face, you know, and go about your daily life. In a perfect world, it wouldn't happen. But we don't live in a perfect world. You're never gonna be at the same place you were before all this happened. Looking back, I didn't realize what I was doing could be labeled as strong. Where's yours? Shooting is an activity that allows us to just relax and get rid of all the things that you worry about. Whatever you were going through the week doesn't seem to matter by the time you're done. No, nope. all gone. My husband, we've got married in 2015. It's difficult. I mean, I could go through the motions, but any time an intimate moment happened, I would become withdrawn. To trust somebody, you know, after sexual assault, It has been so difficult to work through that. I was a victim when I was 13, a victim when I was 14, and a victim when I was 34. Some people say there's signs that something's wrong with this child. Well, you took a look at my grades, they were perfect. I was good at pretending nothing happened. Nothing happened. I wasn't that girl. When I was 13, that one didn't get reported. It was a, a first cousin. When I was 14, I worked for the Bureau of Land Management. They told me, oh, well, you know, you go out and ride with this guy. It was, it was okay at first. Well, then we went down on the bottom road. It was in a wooded area, trees, absolutely nobody around. Then the incident happened and the whole situation confused me. What, what am I gonna do? I can't scream, nobody's gonna hear me. I can't run, where am I gonna run to? When I finally was able to mutter stop, he did stop. Then he took me back like nothing happened. When you talk to Native women who have lived their whole lives on a reservation and they say, I can't think of anyone, any woman that I know who hasn't been victimized in this way. Native women have told me that 
what you do when you raise a daughter in this environment is you prepare her for what to do when she's raped, not if, but when. The federal government defines your identity as an Indian or a non-Indian. The same crime committed on the same plot of land can change jurisdiction or power depending on the race of the perpetrator and the race of the victim. When we think about sexual assault in the United States, it's sort of a linear understanding of how the justice system works. When we move that same crime into Indian country, onto a reservation, then you take that already difficult system and you add all these extra pieces to it, where you have the federal government, tribal government, maybe even the state government. It becomes much more complex. It makes that conviction even more difficult to attain. If one agency drops the ball or one piece of evidence doesn't get collected correctly, the whole house of cards falls. And so you take all of the baggage that you already bring when a survivor comes forward and you completely manipulate all of these questions about jurisdiction and land and race, and sometimes nothing happens as a result. The city of Wolf Point is a very small town. You know, we're hundreds and hundreds of miles from any large metropolitan area. We are not similar to the rural America, small, sleepy little town. We have sexual crime constantly, constantly. Wolf Point sits um, on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation. I mean, we're a tiny, tiny little, little department. The tribal government has authorized us and our officers to enforce their law on tribal members, on tribal lands. Here on the reservation, 60 and 70% of all them kids, female especially, that live here, that they're in danger of somehow being assaulted sexually. Whether it was at a very, very young age or Several times after they re reached a mature age, they've been, they have been victimized. It is nothing, it is absolutely nothing for us to see an uh, eight to a 10 year old completely sexually active. And I, uh, completely sexually active. So do I think sexual assaults are, are horribly common here? Yeah, absolutely. I think we only know about the, the tip of them. Every statistic that is given to a Native American child, I was that statistic. Sexual assault isn't what somebody brings up around the dinner table. I think it's the shame of it. You don't want everybody knowing what happened. When you're a kid, you don't understand that living here is different from living somewhere else. Did you take some of these? I was a mom at 15. I was a mom again at 18. I was a mom again at 20. I have wanted to be a foster parent since, since I knew what it was like to be taken by, in by a family that wasn't yours somebody that has given you that love and that stability and that safety. You should go find a book and read. Yeah, you. Very rewarding when you could give the comfort and the safety to a child who may have not known it before they came to your home. Do we need to stick you in a bubble, my son? Yes. <laughs> I have five kids in my home. I definitely didn't have the life that my kids do. I still see you, you're still doing chores. <laughs> Everything in this life is for my kids. They will never grow up like I did.
I have worked night shift since the beginning of my career where somebody sees the worst traumatic experience of their life I see this is what happens every night as a woman police officer I, I could understand how scared they are I could understand you know the unwanted sexual experience they just had Nine times out of ten, I don't know what happens after they leave the hospital. I don't know what happens after I get my statement, after I do my report. Just to be that little bit of hope for them at that moment. You be their strength when they don't have any. We've had young cops to come in, come in the one day and they got all their shit and they drop it on the floor and say, you guys don't pay me enough work at this place. And they head out. It's, it's hard to be a police officer here. It's hard to see the bad. And, and it's, it's constant. Little Bot Fort Peck, for those that don't know, it's in the very northeast corner of Montana. We do have over 2 million acres and our population is, it's over 10,000, but it's a large area with little resources. We have a problem with drugs, substance abuse, those issues. We don't have the money to hire licensed addiction counselors. We don't have the manpower in law enforcement. Everything affects everything else. So our problems all the way around, it's a domino effect. I am the chief judge for the Fort Peck Assiniboine and Sioux tribes. A lot of the families that we see in court, they are living one, two, three families in one home. The housing shortage, it, it becomes an issue. Along with the sex assault, we always come down to what are some of the underlying issues and a lot of it that we've seen is it, it, there's drugs and alcohol involved. The trauma that has developed, you know, over the generations. Some of the assaults are generational and they're within, you know, the, the same home. Pretend it wasn't there and maybe it will go away. You know, the next generation, it won't happen again. But it, it continues. One of the things we do know nationally is that very, very, very few people who are sexually assaulted decide to report the crime but I think Native women are probably less likely because the system is so broken. And a lot of times when I try to explain it, people don't even believe me because it's so bizarre. And the reason it's bizarre is because there's been this patchwork of laws that don't talk to each other over the last century. It's not just what happened at that one night in that one place. There's a whole history and a whole culture and a whole society Oh, here it is, the Muscogee Treaty, my ancestors' treaty. And it's from a 1790, right after the revolution, so right after the Constitution. And then here's our Trail of Tears, where Alabama and Georgia now meet was our original territory. And then we're marched here to Indian Territory. This is the army forcing you, you know, and so in a conflict zone today, we understand that there's a lot of sexual assault going on, and that's essentially what was going on here. While we're on these trails, people are dying from hunger and fatigue. By the time we got here, we had so much trauma, you know, just the movement itself would have been bad enough. Tribes were forced, in some cases, to seed millions of acres we're gonna take all this land, but we're gonna to reserve to you, this tribe, this, this area, and that will be your area. Within the boundaries, which were often defined in the treaties, 
that's considered Indian country and that's where the tribe is gonna have power, but they're also gonna share that power with the federal government. The treaties that were signed by tribal leaders sort of acquiesced to this idea that the government's gonna take care of us now. The federal government essentially said, you will give us your land in exchange, we will make sure that you are kept safe, secure, fed, clothed, housed. That's the trust responsibility. Now today, it has even a broader connotation federal agencies are supposed to be providing those same benefits. So whether that's law enforcement, whether that's a hospital, whether that's a school. But what comes along with that is a form of paternalism, where the United States is sort of our guardians, and we are the wards, and we benefit from their benevolence. So that then conflicts with the idea that tribal nations want to be sovereign and have full authority on their lands. But tribes really need the trust responsibility in many cases because they were so poor. Copy, 2051. We're like every other reservation across the United States. We're like a third world country. One year of experience here is like 10 years experience in a city. The Bureau of Indian Affairs is responsible for providing many programs in Indian country. Law enforcement is just one of those programs. They oversee our spending, our manpower. Are we keeping records correctly? Are we investigating cases correctly? The biggest thing in a sexual assault case is we have to take care of that victim. Being that we're so short-handed, it can be frustrating if uh, we have to choose. Do we let our evidence go or do we stay with our victim? knowing that he's the only one on that night, and sometimes we have to leave that scene unsecured. If I leave, this evidence here could be destroyed. And most of the time, we don't have a problem securing the crime scene, but it has happened. We should have 21 police officers. Right now, we're down nine positions, and that's not, that's not a lot of people. We have a hiring pool that is literally nothing here on the reservation. Even though we open it up to off-reservation people, we've had some applicants, but there's no place to live here, so people don't want to come here. There is no houses for sale, no houses for rent. Where's that person going to live? The officers who are stuck here now are our constants. They're waiting for it to get better, but a couple of them will tell us, man, I'm getting burnt out. I want to do something else, but I don't want to leave you guys high and dry. I know what the problem is. I can see what it is, but I, I don't know if you want to blame I, I, the BIA, the federal government. Um, well, I don't think anyone in law enforcement anywhere in the United States would ever tell you that they have enough resources. Uh, but we do very well with the resources that we have. Uh, we, we always want more because we can do more if we have more. The BIA has a trust responsibility to provide the law enforcement, the public safety for Indian country. Places where we have limited resources, we do see uh, violent crime rates to tend to be uh, higher. Hey buddy, you better start making your way home. It's almost 11, almost curfew. Stick close to your yard. It pisses me off that somebody could take a child's innocence. The only sexual assaults I know are the ones that I take the reports on. I could assume how often it happens. That's not a place you want your mind to wander. Dispatch. 97 in the area. You guys are out after curfew. What are we 
vehicle. What about these two? Where do you guys belong? Take them all to the PD. Okay, let's go. You two in this car over here. Okay. A curfew isn't in effect because we're mean people. You guys don't understand the dangers that can happen after night to a child who is defenseless against an adult. Can you explain to me why there's a curfew? Because there's people out here that have nowhere around. Like, then they can hurt you. Yeah. We begin tonight with what one Cascade County judge describes as the harshest sentence he's ever given. Today, Richard Tome was sentenced to life in the Montana State Prison for raping a 13-year-old developmentally he was sentenced disabled. to 50 years in the Montana State Prison for raping a woman Man outside who of a rape guilty to law. raping a Helena girl under the age of seven has been sentenced to 35 years been in prison. Sentenced to 100 years in prison for sexual assault. You know, for victims when they know that options like that exist 25, 50 years. It's like this huge number to them. And then they come to tribal court and they're like, one year, just one year. How could it just be one year? We don't agree either, but that's how, that's how it is. If a tribal court exercises criminal jurisdiction, they can take a rape case. There's two main restrictions though. One, if it involves a non-Indian defendant, they can't. The other limitation is a sentencing cap. Congress passed a law that said you can only sentence an offender to one year, maximum. And that would be for any crime. That includes homicide, it includes child sexual abuse, it includes rape. When you think about rape and you think about somebody who, who's a perpetrator of that kind of crime and you think what do they deserve one year doesn't usually sound like the right answer. You know, the federal government doesn't have those kinds of limitations. So if you have a rape case or a child sex abuse case and you do want to see that perpetrator put away, the best possibility for you is that it will go federal, as, as they say, go federal. The unanimous conclusion is that the primary... And if it goes federal, the prosecutor is actually the United States Attorney. The U.S. Attorney's offices, they're primarily doing kind of high stakes, white collar crime, major drug trafficking rings, terrorism or immigration. So it's very different than what anybody else who's experienced a sexual assault will go through because 99% of the time, it's a local state crime. The issue of violence against women uh, in Indian country is a significant issue and one that we take very seriously. Uh, but inherently, there's always going to be difficulties proving these type of crimes because they're often committed in private and it's often difficult to find corroborating evidence. When a prosecutor decides not to take a case forward for, for many different kinds of reasons, um, and some of them are valid, right? Sometimes they just don't have what they need to put a case together. That means there's no indictment, there's no trial, there's no verdict. Numerous cases are declined for insufficient evidence, and it is something that has to be worked on. Now there are bigger questions of jurisdiction here that perhaps Congress wants to look at, tribes certainly need to look at. Our job is to enforce the law uh, and we'll work with whatever framework we're given and right now this is the framework we have to work in. Having the federal government involved in crime control in Indian country hasn't really resulted in anything super fantastic. If over half of Native women report that they've been victims of sexual violence, whatever system's in place is not working. When my mom reported it, you know, they were asking me all sorts of questions, and finally I said, you know what? I was 14 years old. I did not have the right to consent to a man as old as my father to do those things to me. I said, that's the law, that's the bottom line. I was adamant that he wasn't gonna do that to anybody else. I was going to survive. 
and move forward and do what I had to do. The defendant, he pled guilty. My biggest frustration is that he got off with three years probation. He was back in the community quickly, and I had to see him when this was all fresh. And here I am with all these issues because of those events that will never go away. I don't have so much hurt now as opposed to anger. Justice wasn't served in my opinion. Three years probation for fucking up my entire life, excuse my language. You know, I guess I could feel lucky that I got a conviction. Some cases don't get a conviction. There are many places where the relationship between the federal government and the local tribal officials has been working quite well. But, I mean, each reservation is different. Eventually, tribes are going to want to strengthen their governments such that they don't need that help from the outside. Tribes and the federal government trying to get along, that's not a solvable problem. Many tribes in the Great Plains, they just live on federal dollars. We're fortunate to not have to be dependent upon that. We're probably the wealthiest tribe in the Great Plains. This here world will go right into the new aquatic center. Baseball diamonds, basketball courts, horseshoes, mini golf. We used oil money to build these houses. And it was for the sole purpose of staffing so we could get professionals here. We're at a level in the new millennium where we have the wealth and we have the intellectual capacities. We can do a much better job than what we're doing right now to protect our women and children and have justice for them because that's what a great nation will do. At every level, we are not adequately functioning to provide the services that are needed in a critical situation. The number of rapes and assaults on women and children is underreported. There are very few federal cases that go. There's no justice at the police level, at the court system level. The state is in a state of emergency. It's in a state of crisis. It almost seems like a roller coaster around here with sexual assault. Sometimes we do really good and it goes all the way to prosecution real quick. And sometimes it just seems to fall through the cracks. Yeah, it's a CAT victim. We're advocates. We help get justice for sexual assault victims. We're their liaison between law enforcement, the court, the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office. We're with them beginning to end. We actually do the criminal investigations the BIE does for, for birth hold. Any sexual assault throughout Indian country should be reported up uh, to, to the FBI as well. Both of us have jurisdiction out there to work those type of cases, so it could go to either place, and the tribes have to refer it to one of us. A lot of times that don't happen like that. Maybe some of our officers, they don't trust the feds and they think we need to do things ourselves. That's where my office has had to step up and give um, reports to the FBI as well of things that we know have happened. We make sure we take good notes so we can give them to whoever needs them. This actually should be all taken care of by law enforcement, not us. I can't write out a indictment. I can't go to grand jury and present a case. The fact that it is so confusing and that you could have up to three different departments that had jurisdiction it really is a maze. If the goal is conviction, there has to be clear lines of communication and partnership.
once you guys came and started asking questions, I thought, you know what, I don't know the answers to these things and I need to find out. That's part of the reason why we're doing the case file review. I guess part of that is on me too. I should know this by now. Sometimes we don't get our reports in right away and that's because there's so much work coming in, which is unfortunate for the victim. The FBI, BIA, they're swamped, so sometimes those cases just don't move as quickly as we'd like. The U.S. Attorney's Office uh, tells us that that our agents are, are doing fairly well. We hear from some folks locally that maybe say something different. When there's poor relationships between these different law enforcement agencies, who loses? The victims are the ones that then fall through the cracks. With the hard feelings that have come through history, there's distrust, valid distrust, on the part of some tribal officials to the federal government. But she doesn't care. She wants justice. I came back 11 years ago now to help our reservation. But now I want it safe so my daughters are safe here. Kids used to ride everywhere. There'd be packs of kids running around this town when I first moved home. If you drive down these roads, you don't see kids riding bike outside anymore. And it's an emotional thing to talk about because we've had to go back to high school students and talk about safety. If we don't send it to the feds and we prosecute them through tribal court, they're only going to get days in jail. And if they leave the reservation, then they're not held and bound by it. Like if you were prosecuted through the federal government, it'll follow you everywhere. Something that happens with tribal court could be swept under the rug. This is why we need the Fed to make sure that our um, victims are getting the justice that they deserve. We need the feds right now because tribes are struggling to stand up on their own and do the kinds of rape prosecutions we might want to see. Until tribes are able to have full jurisdiction restored, there is a place for the federal system. When Obama became president, it really felt like the first time that there was a federal presence that was like, you know, we could really do something about this. And so they ended up putting together the Tribal Law and Order Act, and there's a bunch of different pieces to it. But the one change that mattered the most for survivors was a change in the sentencing authority of tribal courts. We got three years as opposed to one. All tribes have one year, that's the law. If you check off all of these boxes, then we will let you um, sentence somebody to three years. A lot of tribes have just said, no, we need to be able to be independent and make our own decisions about how we want to run our court system. So thank you, but no thank you. And other tribes have had to struggle to meet all of these requirements so that they can actually exercise that three-year sentence. And it's expensive, and so most tribes can't afford it. to have a court of record, which is expensive. You need a prosecutor, you need a public defender, you need a judge. There's very few native lawyers in this country. How are you gonna recruit somebody with that skill set to come out and live in a remote area that they're not from, where there's not really any housing for outsiders, and develop that infrastructure for a criminal justice system? It's just more difficult than anyone can imagine when the Tribal Law and Order Act took effect, I remember thinking, how are we going to do this? We didn't have any attorneys in the court system at that time. We had prosecutors, judges that had been in the system and, and knew the system, you know, worked in it for a long time, but were just missing the degree. I wanted to make sure that our court was ready to move forward. Fort Peck is the only tribe right now in our region that is doing enhanced sentencing under the Tribal Law and Order Act. I went to school for my law degree specifically to come back here for my people. My shoes. My shoes. 
Sophia is six years old right now, and when I went to law school, she was six months old. I had to leave her for the first semester, basically, and hope that everybody was going to be able to take care of her in my absence. When I moved back here, I was so much more grateful for all of those things that I had missed. Yeah, the resources are limited, but the biggest resource is your family and your support system. I feel fortunate that, you know, my, my daughters, they're not by any means afraid to speak their mind. It was big at this living room, Mom. Yeah. And that's so gross doing that. I tell them things like, you know, you're our future. You girls are going to be setting examples for other kids, and you're going to be leaders of our tribe someday. You better go in and get your book then, okay? They see the news that we read with, you know, missing and murdered, and I talk about self-defense and not being afraid to speak up for yourself. I haven't sheltered them in a sense of the topics that we'll talk about. Talking about those not so comfortable things, it goes a long way. When you have limited space and resources, you have to make hard decisions. You might say, well, let's go ahead and rely on the federal government until we have the capacity to do it on our own. But it still feels like maybe to a survivor, the tribal justice system isn't taking her case seriously. So we hear it all the time. Well, it doesn't matter. You guys are just gonna let them go. Well, it's, that's not the officer. I mean, their jail's half the time overpopulated. Our jail is always full. It's always at capacity. You don't have a lot of money, and if there's some people that need medical care and we're not able to pay it, then we'll put them on house arrest, and then they can pay for their own medical. Tribal jail isn't seen as a punishment. They have a bed to sleep in. They get three meals. They have a place to stay. You know, they're not wandering the streets, and especially when it's cold out. If they know they're being charged or sent to tribal court, that is no sweat. They have zero fear in regards to their own court system. The system definitely needs some improvement, but where do you start? Had I thought that it would happen a third time? Never. I had worked in the courts, so I, I knew it would have been hard to get a conviction in that, that case. It would have been he said, she said. Who's more credible? Can prosecutors prove their case? And do I want to go through and relive that for a maybe? Not after dealing with the other two times. It, it's harder now at 39 telling my story than it was at 15 because I know more things now. When the system has failed you time and time and time again, you don't feel empowered. You don't feel like you want to stand up and speak out and report people and accuse people. It feels like a disconnect between this moment of Me Too and the reality of Indian country sexual assault. A lot of Native women would look at that and kind of laugh, like that would never happen here. Even if there was a Bill Cosby here and there were 21 victims, right? It still wouldn't matter. I just know that when you are sexually assaulted, that it never leaves you. You never 100% get over it. 
I just don't know what it would be like to... I guess I do know what it would be like to have to run into that person that, you know, raped you, molested you, sexually assaulted you, and to have to face them, it takes a lot of courage to report it, but it takes even more courage to have to face them. And it's not just in the courtroom, it's in everyday life. You know, every single emotion that you went through and then somebody else telling you, you know, the details of them being sexually assaulted. It, it's not easy to hear somebody else's story, to be that scared, vulnerable person you were when you were sexually assaulted. It's not easy pushing those feelings back, that fear that's always a constant in the back of your mind. And then having, you know, children and hoping that that, that they never feel that. It's so important to us that my children know their heritage and their culture and where they're from. My daughters, and they're one in three. My boys, they know about respecting women and respecting partners. I'm breaking the cycle in my own family, but we need to do it nationwide. Otherwise, we're just gonna keep going on this vicious cycle. Just because we have a card that says we're enrolled members, we're still citizens of the United States, but we're also citizens of our nations. Why are we different than every other person? Why don't we have the justice everybody else does? The United States Commission on Civil Rights, they've issued now two reports that both skewered the federal government, said, the level of underfunding in Indian country is embarrassing and, and, and shameful. You're, fa you're failing. You are failing these people. And there's been no response to it. It's not gonna be a quick fix. But what we have to do is continually go back to Congress with the notes that we have from the ground and to say, all right, we need more and here's what it is. are causing us more pain and I do believe that um, I do believe that will change someday. Deb Holland, she is one of two Native American women, the first Native American women to be elected to the United States Congress. Tonight we made history. Gosh, on election night, when two Native women got into Congress, I mean, I can't tell you how that felt. As a member of the United States Congress, we all take an oath, and I take this oath seriously because every congressional leader has a responsibility to uphold the federal government's trust responsibility. I think, you know, she can't make one bill pass. She can't pass a law by herself. But we have a lot better chance of getting traction on something when she's there than when there are no Native women in Congress at all. Investigating these crimes and acting timely on the cases. Thank you, it's an honor. It's an honor to be asked a question by you right now. Yes, the federal government has taken over in many cases, but tribes are continuing to fight to make sure that at the end of the day, they are able to define what is right and what is wrong. 
and do it on their own terms. All of your work is so important and I'm grateful for every single thing all of you have done to raise this issue and I want you to know that I stand behind you 100%. I get a lot of credit for work that I do, but that's a burden to carry on your shoulders if you feel like you're the only one in that community who's really speaking out. Those, those people are my inspiration. I see strong women who may have bad days, but they're the ones that are in their home communities that are doing the hard work that nobody wants to hear about. They're the heroes. Those people are amazing. Those women are amazing. I may fit into all the statistic criteria. Fine. I'm still going to have a good life. I'm still going to keep pushing forward. There's no other option. This is my community. This is where I've grown up and made memories. I feel like if I'm not here putting my best foot forward and forgetting everything that happened the day before, who else is going to? Who else is going to be here to to be somebody else's hope?